This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Our first speaker is Nicola Kramer. Um, she's a former professional mountain bike racer um, and now runs one of the most successful women's uh, cycling programs in the United States. Um, so she has a, a horse racing background um, and she's been working both at the regional grassroots level um, but also with uh, international competitors. So without further ado, here's Nicola Kramer. Um, I'm going to talk about the passion of cycling, um, the passion particularly of women's cycling, and um, I'm going to condense about seven years into about 20 minutes, so um, I'm going to kind of <laughs> rush through it a little bit, and my slides might not synchronize with what I'm saying, but you'll, it's just really for, so you can get a feel for the team and what I do. And um, So anyway, um, my team, um, seven years ago, I was a competitor in Northern California, and I was racing on a co-ed team, and our little team was um, cat four women, and we were doing really well. And the men's team was doing okay, but they were getting all the perks from the sponsor. And I thought, well, this is not quite right, so I decided to start a team. Um, what that meant, I had no idea. It was just... I was in a raging fit one day, and I said, I've had enough of this. I'm going to start my own team. So within probably two weeks, it came together, um, which led me to believe that I was doing the right thing. And Northern California has such a rich pool of female athletes, that, and there's a great um, amount of racing. So it was very easy to create a roster. And there were a few other teams at the time and um, a lot of people showed a lot of interest in my team. So the first team was ProMan Racing. And ProMan is a chemical engineering company based in Dusseldorf. And they had no relationship to cycling. It was purely, I met one of the owners of the company a um, couple years prior. I happened to run into him. He said, what, what am I doing? I said, well, I'm trying to start a team. And our first year budget was about $25,000, and I made that look good. Um, a lot of kind of smoke and mirrors, and you know, we were trying to come across as being very professional, and there are really lots of very simple ways you can do that. But on the team, we had um, some amazing riders, and they were all beginners, and cat fours, cat threes, and they worked together really well as a team. Um, Let's see, juniors. Um, right from the very start, we worked with juniors. And juniors can be of any age, um, up to 18. <coughs> then they move into the senior categories. Um, it's very inspirational for me to work with the juniors. And we're really one of the very few professional teams that have an integrated program. And what this means is, Typically, your professional riders will go to a race as a team of eight or six um, and race together, hopefully to win. But what we chose to do was take a chance and allow some of the younger riders to race with our professional riders. This puts us at a deficit, but that you would think. But these young women, um, and they're usually anywhere from 15, 16, 17, 18, will show up and be really willing to work and learn. And we saw a lot of success with this. Um, it worries the professional girls too, the older girls, because they're like, oh crap, 
you know, this young girl is up and coming and I better step it up because she's going to take my place otherwise. And these young girls want to impress the professional riders. So it worked really well and I wish more teams would do that. So we've always, um, right since the inception, we had no money, but we still included juniors into the program. We worked really hard and um, became very successful. Our, um, all of our team members are also raced for the US national team. Um, we work very closely with them. And well, this is a program that basically goes to trade teams, which is what you are when you're a sponsored team, to select athletes to race for the US. And a lot of trade teams won't release their riders because they want their trade team, that they want to have their best riders at their race in America to win the race. Well, you have to have a long vision. You have to be farsighted. And our goal from, I think, the second year we had a team was the Olympics. And it's really easy to say that, oh, we're going to send riders to the Olympics. But what it takes is a lot of sacrifice um, a lot of dedication, so much hard work and support from you know teammates, family, friends, whoever. So we've always worked very closely with the national team knowing that it will give our riders the advantage eventually because they go over to Europe, race in Europe at the highest caliber of racing and when it comes to a world championships or Olympics, you're racing against the rest of the world. So we were, you know, how, we got a step up on um, a lot of the other teams, so our athletes moved forward very quickly. Our, um, after ProMan, actually ProMan as a sponsor has stayed with the team the entire time. Um, our next sponsor was Peanut Butter & Co, which is a small company in New York, and it was a great partner for cycling. Um, who doesn't love peanut butter? And you know, a lot of athletes eat peanut butter pre-race, post-race. Um, that was a very successful partnership, and um, the team incrementally grew um, in sponsorship dollars and also in the level of riders. But again, we still always included juniors along the way. Um, and then after that, that's um, actually one of our riders who was a junior. Um, she goes to Marion University now on a um, full scholarship, cycling scholarship. But she joined the team when she was 14 and saw a lot of success. She's raced in Europe, junior world championships. She was third. Um, she's a great character. And you know she would come on the road with us, and she was homeschooled. And the professional riders would help her with her homework. And you know we, <laughs> we always put school first. But she's you know um, a, a great girl and doing super well in school. And as you can see, she's a character. Um, that's another um, racer, Teresa Cliff Ryan, who she was on the Olympic long team this year, didn't make the selection, but she's actually um, gone back to speed skating and she's trying to go to the Winter Olympics in Sochi. So she's um, made a really quick switch from cycling last year to speed skating this year. So um, we don't know what will happen, but you know, we wish her luck. And then national champions. Um, one of the other focuses on the team, um, there's a race calendar in America called the National Race Calendar. And Quite frankly, it's pretty insignificant in the rest of the world. It's great because it provides a platform for our riders to race. And it's a race series all over the US. And a lot of teams would focus on winning the NRC, which you know nobody really knows what it is outside of cycling. National champions, people tend to know what they are. World champions, Olympians. So we really honed in our focus. Um, and it was, it was pretty bold of us to do that from the beginning, especially when we were a tiny team and you know we didn't have a big budget and we didn't have fancy cars and all the rest of it, but we were, you know, we were like, okay, we're gonna go to the Olympics, World Championships, and we're gonna win nationals. And we've won a lot of national championships, I've lost count actually, but um, for our juniors and our elite riders. Um, sponsorship, this is what drives professional cycling. It's it's a, not a revenue generating model, professional cycling, and you know a lot needs to change. So we're completely reliant on sponsorship, and luckily our program provides, you know, great social media. I mean, even the juniors, we have 14 top juniors in our program right now, and even in their contracts, we we ask them to make sure that they're savvy on Facebook and Twitter, and you know they're actually social media ninjas. They're amazing, 
And so that's of advantage to our sponsors and the partners that we work with. Um, it's really challenging running a women's team, particularly in America, well, actually all over the world, but the media really is not that interested in telling the story of female athletes in general. Um, some of the top sports, yes, they get a little airtime. Um, it's, it's really challenging and it, it makes my job more difficult. Um, you can have a women's race and a men's race run simultaneously at, at, an, at a venue and they will focus on the men's race and put it out in the media. And a lot of times we'll be at a bike race and the fans will say, you know, oh wow, we didn't even know women raced. Um, it's, it's a problem. So when you're looking at sponsorship, it's very challenging. So we sell other kinds of stories. Um, Winning is a big part of bike racing. It's a big part of being competitive. Um, that's why we do it. That's why we race bikes and don't just ride bikes. But our team has really reached out into the community. Um, we make sure that all the riders connect with the community. When we go to a bike race, we don't just show up and race. We'll go to a school. Um, you know, We've got one coming up um, in Redlands and then another one in Silver City, New Mexico. And we have to drive you know, an hour and 15 minutes outside of Silver City, which is tiny, to this little school. Nobody visits the school. But the impact is huge for the community and for the children in the school. So that's, you know, we, we do a lot other than just racing the bikes. And that's a very important aspect of um, what our team is about. So brand ambassadors, <laughs> you would think, right, that any marketing ad agency would go, wow, yeah, you know, they're amazing ambassadors for, for any brand. Beautiful women, athletic women, very educated women, um, but it's still a challenge. Um, it's really a mystery, and I get asked the question a lot, you know, why do we not see women's racing on television, but we see men's racing on television? Yeah, it's, it's challenging. And they're really, um, it, it just comes down to media and what they're interested in. And, you know, I've talked to so many people about, would you watch these women race bikes? And they're aggressive, they race like men do. And they say, yes, I'd love to, but, you know, we're still faced with these challenges. But it's not just cycling, it's, you know, a lot of women's sport. So our current sponsor is Exergy Development Group, and they're based in Boise, Idaho, and they develop wind farms. And the owner of the company, James Karkoulis, just has a passion for cycling. Um, he's not really advertising his wind farms. It's, you know, big, um, big, big wind farms. I mean, it's, and he's, we're very fortunate to have him as a sponsor, and his investment in the team is significant. He was with us last year and continues with us this year. There's a little bit about racing and community, um, the domestic races that we do, 120 domestic races or domestic days, um, 40 overseas, and then school visits per year. And as you can see, there's some of my riders there with a bike. And you know, it's, it's really impactful to go to schools and teach children just the value of teamwork, um, I think, you know, the success of our team is largely due to the fact that every team member, we hire them for different reasons. We don't necessarily hire them because they're the strongest or the fastest, because they have to have a great personality. They're, we're on the road with them all year. Um, you know, they have to fit as a group and work together, but also the roles have to be established pretty early, and that is a team leader, and the domestiques. The domestiques are the, the riders that will help assist. They sacrifice, they give up everything to help their team leader get to the ultimate goal, which is winning the race. And you know there are other teams out there with more horsepower than we have, um, but there's girls on that team that perhaps want to see something more in it for themselves than the team goal of getting that leader to the line. And then things get messed up and you don't win races. Um, really establishing the hierarchy, not that one of the domestiques wouldn't get an opportunity, but establishing that initially is um, critical to the success of the team. London Olympics, well, when we were Peanut Butter & Co, we added 2012 to the name, um, and that was three years ago. 
we made a bold statement and we said, okay, we are now focused on the London Olympics. And we made it very, very public. And other teams will say, oh yeah, our goal is the Olympics and, and so on and so forth. But what it entails is something that was beyond anything I'd experienced. Um, we hire riders and you and now having been through this Olympic cycle with success, I mean, we actually had two riders go to the Olympics. One of them there, Kristen Armstrong, who got a gold medal in the time trial and another one of our riders, Lauren Tamayo, in the team pursuit. But what we learned was the detail orientation of these women was so incredible and the sacrifice was beyond anything I'd ever seen. And so it, it really educated us in what we look for in athletes for our program and being detail oriented is really critical. Um, you can be strong, you can have a great personality, but it really comes down to the details. When you make those little changes and you, those percentages and you add them all up, it, you, know, you, you become a champion. It's, it's something that a lot of people disregard. I mean, it might be something as simple as your cousin's getting married, but you're training that weekend, you have to miss the wedding. Or it might mean coding your cassette with something special that makes it spin faster. Or, I mean, there's so many components that really go into it that were beyond my experience. But having been through this cycle, it's um, a pretty fascinating experience. Also, one of the hardest years of my life, um, the level of intensity of an Olympic athlete skyrockets um, as we get closer to the Olympics. And, you know, that has a ripple effect on the team. So really trying to keep a team together during that time is, is pretty intense. Um, but, you know, we saw a lot of success and we were the only American team to go to the Olympics and get medals. So, um, you know, thank you to my riders. <laughs> thank you. And that's um, road team. And there's Lauren Tamayo and Kristen Armstrong. And Kristen is, um, you know, a fascinating story. She got a gold medal in Beijing in 2008 and then retired. And her husband jokingly said to her one day, oh, you know, wouldn't it be great when you have a baby to go back to the Olympics and have him on the podium? <laughs> well, <laughs> that sowed the seed. <laughs> and she thought about it and thought about it. And she said, yes, OK. And she's a partner with me on, with the team. And um, so she made a comeback. So she had her baby, took um, not even a year off. Actually, she was still breastfeeding at her first race. Oh, yeah, and she was determined to come back. So that first year, we, we saw the ups and downs, um, you know, and she thought, you know, she was going to do a Paula Radcliffe and come back and break records, but that didn't happen right away. The following year, however, she was back on form, um, her body was back, and, you know, she was more determined, more focused. Her pain threshold was different because she just had a baby. Um, so it was high before. So she was so focused and determined to get to London, not just to be on the Olympic team, not just to podium, but to get gold. That was the only reason she was going back. So she fought really hard, and we all supported her. Her husband was amazing. Um, her son, Lucas, came on the road with us all year. Um, and it was actually a delight to have him around because it eased the tension of the professional athletes that were going into competition. They would see his little smiling face and be relaxed. It was really wonderful to have him around. And um, so, you know, as we approached the Olympics six weeks before, um, everything was going great. She was right on schedule, right on track. We were racing at the biggest women's race in America, the Exegy Tour in Boise, Idaho, her hometown. So she really wanted to go out and just really put a stamp on things. The first, the first um, stage was a prologue. Um, for those of you who don't know, it's a short time trial. So it's an individual against the clock race and it was just very short. She goes out. She, it's got a U-turn in it. There was a little oil in the road. She crashed. And it was televised, so I'm standing back there and I'm watching it going, no, no, this is not happening. Crashed, broken collarbone. Oh. 
Yeah, so <laughs> we, I mean, it, it was, our worlds turned upside down in that moment and she came in, the um, you know, great doctors at St. Luke's took care of her, operated on her the next day. She was determined to show the media that this was not gonna hold her back. She got operated on, came to the next stage, came to the race. Her teammate won that stage just by chance. I mean, so she shows up, teammate wins, and Kristen's there in a sling and drugs and all the rest of it, but she is so defiant and so determined. She said, I, I'm, I'm going, I'm going to the Olympics. I'm gonna get a gold medal still. This is six weeks before. So, you know, I had about this much doubt, but I still had it <laughs> and I just was, well, you know, let's do it. And so, you know, we got her on her bike on the trainer in her sling um, before she should have been, but just for the media, okay, she's back on track, took the sling off, put her on the bike, you know, I mean, we, d we did it all just to kind of keep the energy going that Kristen was still going to the Olympics. Um, and sure enough, she went and went to London and won a gold medal again, which was pretty phenomenal. And her baby got onto the podium. It's a long story of how we got him there. Um, think Homeland Security, SAS, um, yeah. But we got him there, that was, that was the reason she wanted to be there. So we fought through Hampton Court and took a while, but we got in there. So that's that picture, which actually ended up being a visa commercial. Um, so Lauren Tamayo, she's from Asheville, and um, she's been a domestique on many teams for many years. So she's the person that sets the rider up for the win. And it, it's cycling is a team sport, but people recognize the winner, right? You, you know, a Lance Armstrong, a Mark Cavendish, or you know, a Kristen Armstrong, or whoever, a good sprinter might be. But you, they can't do it without people like her. So. Her story really quickly is, you know, she, she worked really hard for many years. She started racing as a junior rider and she, Lauren was never the one to get the glory. She was the one that set it up, but not many people recognize that. But we would try and get stories in the media as much as possible about women like her because without her, the rest of the team wouldn't, wouldn't happen, the wins wouldn't happen. So anyway, so she went, on a team pursuit, she went as in a team sport, a team pursuit, and got a silver medal. So we were really happy that she got her silver medal. And this is just a really super quick little video on the team. It just gives you a little flavor of the team. So it was actually a transition piece from one sponsor to another sponsor. Everybody's gonna run away today. Oh. Why be ordinary when you can be extraordinary? It's just time to get lead. Excellence demands sacrifice. <clears throat> is my expression. Nobody has ever seen his face but smile. I don't drink your blood just for the taste that oh. Everybody tends to disagree. Life is all about the experience.
All right, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Couple questions, anybody? Yes. Uh, you were talking about detail oriented to be a good racer and to be part of the team. Can you get into a little bit more detail about this? Um, for specifically to be on the team. Uh, yeah, the detail oriented. You say that you were very important. right. Well, for example, um, let's use Kristen Armstrong as an example. She's probably type AAA personality. Um, <laughs> <laughs> seriously, she says that about herself. Um, but wind tunnel. Um, we do a lot of aer aerodynamic testing in the wind tunnel. Um, we've tested helmets, bikes, wheels, booties, speed suits, socks, glasses. Um, those are the kind of details. Um, how a piece of equipment or a piece of fabric um, is in yar, which is a crosswind or a headwind. Um, mm -hmm. Those are the kind of details. Yeah. Yes. I noticed in an earlier slide you talked about the different countries that you went to. Yes. And I was struck that uh, you competed in Qatar, which obviously is a, a Middle Eastern country, you know, one of the more um, liberal one. Could you just talk to that experience of what it was like for both um, the women that competed there and then the, the reception that you got there? Right. I actually didn't go to Qatar, um, or Qatar, as it's pronounced. Um, it's, you know, this is, this is a new phenom, and there's more and more races that are showing up in the Middle East. Um, yet, you know, it's not really encouraged that Middle Eastern women compete. Um, and, it, you know, they don't, we don't show up there as international teams and race against Middle Eastern women. It's usually European and American teams that do. Um, you're pretty isolated when you're there. You stay in, you know, the Ritz-Carlton. Um, you're you're um, chaperoned, and so you don't really get to see the real culture and community so much. Um, was there much coverage of your event? What's that? Was there much coverage? Of your uh, the men's event, yes. The women's, no. <laughs> no. They usually do a little condensed YouTube video if you're lucky. Yeah. Yes. What is she most proud of? Um, interesting question. You'd have to ask that to Lauren, but I would probably say um, working really hard for her leaders on her team. That's the kind of person she is. I mean, she's very proud of her silver medal because it opens doors. Um, it's really the only thing that opens doors in women's cycling. That's why we focus on the Olympics. Um, but yeah, she's really happy to see the success of other people. That makes her very happy. Yes. Um, we do. Um, most of the riders have their own coaches, but within our pool of riders, it's really only about four coaches that we tend to work with. Yes. Do you ever see, uh, and do you envision anything like a, a woman's Tour de France or what there ever was? There is, but you wouldn't know it, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, there are big stage races. We're um, one of the women on our team. She, have you heard the Giro? The, it's the Italian version of the Tour de France. Um, we have a rider that won it um, in 2010, the first American rider to win it, but nobody knows. It's like a tree falling in the woods. Yeah, yeah. So they exist. Yes. Has there been any effort to create your own media coverage, like the YouTube channel or something? Like yeah, that? we do that. Um, you know, again, though, we're limited by budget, but we've had people work for us and produce. We had a um, web documentary series for a while, which was great, and people still look at it. And, you know, it's something that we hope to continue to do. But, yeah. And I have some plans for next year, so we're, we'll see. Yes. Exergy used to have a men's team. How many of the other men's teams have corresponding women's teams? Um, it's fairly popular. Um, the UCI, which is the governing body of cycling worldwide, they you know, have spoken about if, if you're a professional men's team at the highest level, then you have to have a women's team. It's not been implemented. Um, that, I don't think, really would work because it's always an afterthought. You know, it's not, it, it takes a lot to to produce a women's team and you have to be passionate and it's more than full time and you have to have the right people involved in nurturing the project. So um, yeah, there, there are some teams that have women's components. Okay, oh, one more. The majority of the team uh, people have regular jobs or do they? 
Good question. <laughs> well, let's just put it this way. Um, a top professional rider, say, on the BMC men's team could make a million dollars a year. Take that in half, and that's about our budget for the women's team for the entire year for all the riders. So we encourage the riders to work um, at least, you know, we have very educated women on the team with degrees. Um, we have women that can be doctors if they want to be. We have women that can be lawyers if they want to be, but they're following their passion of cycling and their dreams and goals. So we encourage them to keep a hand in the workplace. And nowadays you can work online, so they can even go on the road and work with us. Also, for a female professional cyclist, you're not on your bike eight hours a day. At the most it will be four, occasionally five, but mostly three or two. So what are you gonna do the rest of the day? You may as well work. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, seriously. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, everybody. <laughs>
women had more fractures, 45.5% versus 21.1% for males. And so overall, they found that women were 1.94 times more likely to sustain an injury and four times more likely to sustain a fracture. That was in mountain biking. But again, they only had 22 women. So anyways, it was all relative. But um, this is a slide from my first study about uh, neck and back pain. Um, we were talking about neck and back injuries in the first talk I did at this series. Um, and this study looked at a lot more, 294 male and 224 female cyclists, recreational cyclists, and they were just reporting their injuries. But they did find overall that female cyclists reported one and a half to two times um, more neck and shoulder injuries than the male. And again, we could hypothesize the reasons for that, but we won't get into that. Um, so certainly women can sustain breast injuries. Um, this is just a list of different types of injuries. Nostalgia is pain, uh, chafing and cold injuries, more common runners theoretically could happen in cyclists. Um, contusions, abrasions from falls, lacerations, hematomas, something called uh, Mondor's disease. Contusions are usually mild. Um, they can involve the superficial blood vessels um, in the breast and they can rupture and cause pain and swelling and bruising. Generally ice, uh, anti-inflammatories and some good support and compression resolves them. Hematoma is a collection of blood, um, which again, I think we talked about in my first talk, um, common when you land on your hip or your elbow. They theoretically can happen in the breast as well, and uh, occasionally if they're sore and painful, they can require surgical aspiration. Uh, Maunder's disease is actually thrombophlebitis, so inflammation and dilatation of a superficial vein or blood vessel. Um, they can be, there can be an injury or not an injury. Um, it can just happen. Usually it subsides spontaneously with just symptomatic treatment, compresses, heat or ice, um, compression, and it, it can be quite sore over three to four weeks, but generally it's gone by six to eight weeks. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the female athlete triad. This is uh, one of the trendier subjects in sports medicine in the last decade or two. Um, it, so it's, it's a combination of three different factors leading to injury and uh, trouble. Um, we used to call it disordered eating, osteoporosis, and amenorrhea. So that was maybe 10, 12 years ago, and the definition has changed over time, and we've modified those definitions. And we now say energy deficit, um, or low energy availability, menstrual dysfunction, and skeletal problems. Um, so this is a, a combo of factors or injuries that can arise when there's pressure from coaches, from athletes, from the media, from judges, um, for athletes in certain sports to excel and maintain a low body weight um, to excel at their chosen sport. Um, they can develop practices such as uh, disordered eating and calorie restriction and overtraining. Um, and these types of practices can lead to menstrual irregularities because of the energy imbalance and subsequent bone loss um, because without menstruation, the, without the estrogen around to protect the bone, you can have lower bone density, um, and that can lead to fracture and problems later in life and can cause um, premature osteoporosis. So what's the prevalence of the triad? Um, the full triad, it's, it's fairly low, uh, one to 4%, and that it varies depending on who you study and where you look. Um, but single components, so disordered eating in athletes can be up to 70% depending on the sport. Um, Eating disorders, we used to just classify them by a special psychiatric classification, but now it's, it, the, the definition is a lot more vague and broad, and we know that, that that can exist, eating disorders can exist on a continuum. We say disordered eating. It can be just from skipping meals, not taking in enough calories for what you're putting out, um, versus using diet pills, laxatives, um, um, purging and binging to full-on anorexia. Um, or full, some athletes will over-exercise to burn off the calories, which is part of the binging and purging. Um, the, dis the hallmark of disordered eating or, um, is a distorted body image, and we know that up to 60% of college athletes practice some form of pathologic weight control behavior. Um, when I did my fellowship at Stanford, we had um, the running, the runner's dorm was called the skinny dorm because they basically all had eating disorders <laughs> and everybody knew it and that's just the way it was. And so that's a sport, of course, that's riddled with disordered eating and, and um, body image issues, uh, more for performance in, in that sport. But it just becomes sort of a cultural thing as well in different sports where it's just, it's part of the culture of the sport, um, how you eat, what you eat, what you don't eat, how much you train. And it's very interesting to get into the athlete's heads and it's hard to remove them from that. They just associate performing at a high level with 
being underweight, not eating enough, all kinds of different things, not menstruating. It's not good to menstruate if you're performing at a high level, you know, it's just part of it. Um, so some factors that are associated with the risk of eating disorders, chronic dieting, low self-esteem, family dysfunction, history of physical or sexual abuse, perfectionism is very common. These athletes are often type A personalities, do very well in school, work very hard. And then there's the issue of the pressure from the judges or the teammates, uh, depending on the sport and often lack of nutrition knowledge. They are not educated on what they're doing with their uh, bodies. Sport risk factors, um, obviously sports that are subjectively judged, skating, gymnastics, uh, diving, things like that. Endurance sports where we think you know, low, low body weight equals higher performance and faster times. Um, sports with body contour revealing competition or training wear, such as diving where you're wearing almost nothing, um, or tight lycra, things like that. Sports using weight categories, so actually male rowers have eating disorders and wrestlers have, have a higher prevalence of eating disorders because of the weight categories. Um, and sports especially emphasizing prepubertal body habitus, such as gymnastics. Um, and then overtrained, undernourished, just a general category often kind of going with the endurance sports and lack of knowledge. Um, so health consequences of eating disorders, 10 to 18% may die prematurely from medical problems or psychiatric problems. Um, that can lead to suicide related to the eating disorders. Eating disorders are often a, a mental um, problem more than a physical problem. It's a physiological, psychological disease. Um, reproductive dysfunction, as we mentioned, without estrogen around um, because of the energy deficit um, that affects the reproductive cycle. It affects the bone density and the bone quality. Um, estrogen is protective to bone, as we know, as after menopause, women um, become osteoporotic and lose bone density. Same thing can happen when in a young woman if she's not menstruating for long periods, especially if she's training intensely, intensely um, with a lot of especially impact sports, um, can lead to stress fractures, low bone density, um, things like that, Gastro, gastrointestinal problems from the lack of eating or binging and purging, things like that. Thermoregulatory dysfunction, um, often people with disordered eating have uh, a lot of trouble maintaining their body temperature, get cold frequently, their hands get cold. There's all kinds of um, issues that go with that as well. Performance consequences, decreased aerobic capacity, muscle strength and endurance, obviously. Uh, if your energy input is less than your output, eventually that catches up. Glycogen stores go down. You can't sustain um, repeated uh, race competitions, stage races, things like that. Um, training suffers if you're training a lot back to back. Decreased coordination, concentration, because the blood sugar is low, the brain relies on blood sugar to function. Irritability, impaired judgment, depression, there's often psychiatric uh, components as well, and thermogenesis. So that's the eating disorder part. The other component of the triad is uh, menstrual disorders or amenorrhea. Um, a normal menstrual cycle is somewhere from 23 to 35 days, 10 to 13 of them a year, approximately every month. There's something called oligomenorrhea, which is when the cycle's just longer and it extends out, so you have fewer cycles per year. Um, and that's uh, just related to hormone imbalance um, for different reasons. And then there's something called amenorrhea, which is the absence of three or more menses, so three or more months without cycles, and, and um, usually less, or, and or less than three per year. And that can be primary or secondary, so there's different reasons for that. Typically, the athletic amenorrhea is secondary, or if there's amenorrhea related to caloric restriction, that's we call that secondary. Primary is if is, um, your cycles haven't started yet, and there's another issue causing that. Um, the prevalence of amenorrhea in the general population is somewhere from 2 to 5%. Um, in female athletes, it's quite a bit higher, depending on the study, but it's, it's very common, up to 44%. Um, this is just one study that there's all these different studies that look at where it's more prevalent. Um, this is one that found that leanness sports were higher, had a higher prevalence of uh, menstrual dysfunction and amenorrhea um, rather than training volume sports. Um, but there's other studies that look at training volume as well. Uh, this one looked at elite Norwegian athletes versus controls. So it was a pretty good study. They had a lot of athletes and controls. They found the age of menarche was later in athletes. Um, and that's actually a risk for stress fracture as well. So often when I'm screening young kids, I always ask age of menarche um, because we found that later age of menarche correlates with a higher risk of stress fracture. Um, and it leads with menstrual dysfunction. Uh, so they found that 7% of the athletes versus only 2% of the controls had a history of amenorrhea. 
um, or missed cycles. Um, and they found a similar uh, percentage of athletes versus controls with menstrual dysfunction. But then if they looked at those athletes, that was much higher and the, they found the leanness sports, so sports that focused on lean body weight and, and uh, habitus. Um, known health con con consequences of amenorrhea, certainly infertility on the short term, um, decreased bone mass or osteopenia as it's called, osteoporosis even and long-term osteoporosis and cholesterol abnormalities. Um, the thing with bone density is that young women are building their bone density up until around age 30. And then from then on, it's all downhill. And it can, it can go downhill from 2 to 5% a year. Um, after menopause, it goes down a little bit quicker because you don't have the hormones around. But in, um, when you're still building your bone density, that's a very important time. And we know that in athletes, they don't always build it when they're amenorrheic and they don't have the hormones around. They don't build enough bone density. So then later in life, they can be predisposed to more osteoporosis. <laughs> Once I treated this French ballerina, she was from Paris, and she was about I don't know, 60, and she had been hiking in Peru, and she came back, and you know, she smoked, and she didn't eat, and she was a prima ballerina in France, and I, I was worried about a fracture in her leg or her knee or something, and I said, well, do you know what your bone density is? And she said, oh, it's zero, zero. <laughs> <laughs> it's always been zero. Okay, so we measured it, and sure enough, it was like minus five st standard deviations or something. It really was way less than zero. So, you know, people like that, it's been like that for a while. If you don't build it up, then you have less to work with in the end. Um, there is training related menstrual dysfunction on a continuum. Again, luteal phase deficiency is just a short and last page of, phase of the menstrual cycle. You can still have normal cycle lengths, but the hormones aren't working as well. Ovulation might not work. You may get cycles where you, where you don't ovulate, not even know it. Um, but that can certainly happen related to training and stress and stress on the body, physiologic stresses. Um, exercise amenorrhea typically can be reversed. Um, we usually say with an increase of about 5 to 10 percent in calorie, in, in, increase your calories and then decrease your exercise by about 5 to 10 percent training volume or intensity. But that varies greatly per person. Sometimes it's very hard to reverse. Um, and you always have to make sure they're not pregnant because there's always that possibility in an athlete. Um, so bone loss, as I was mentioning, uh, we found that the vertebral bone mineral density of former um, amenorrheic athletes remains low despite the return of normal um, cycles or even the use of the pill, which is another, the birth control pill, another controversial issue, but just putting someone on the pill for the hormones doesn't bring back the bone density. If an athlete's been amenorrheic for many years, um, that can affect their bone density later, even when they get their cycles back. Um, so the importance is early prevention to prevent the bone loss, um, and there's a window of opportunity in the young athlete. These days, kids don't drink as much milk as they used to. It's very important to drink milk and do weight-bearing activity um, and have re regular menstrual cycles, especially in young women athletes, especially as they're building their bone density. Um, if, if you have suboptimal bone mineral mineralization in this time, you can have effects later in life, osteoporosis, fractures, things like that. We do know that bone loss due to athletic amenorrhea may not be entirely reversible. Um, some bone can be regained with the resumption of menses and, and weight gain and increased caloric intake, but the values are still low. In athletes, we compare um, values to others their age. When we test for osteoporosis, we don't compare to a norm. In young women, as in older women, we always compare to a norm, the standard deviation. So when you have your bone density tested for osteoporosis, it's usually compared to that of a 30-year-old woman, and that's our definition. In young kids, we will do bone densities, and we'll just compare it to other kids their age, um, and also follow their, theirs along to see what it's doing. So the third part of the triangle is osteoporosis, which is a disease char characterized by low bone mass and uh, microarchitectural deterioration of bone tissue and bone quality, leads to increased fragility, risk of fracture, um, and, and can, cause, can lead to hip fractures, spine fractures, low bone mass, and even stress fractures in younger people. So the most important thing for this is prevention, because once it's going, it's very hard to intercept. Um, there's so many components, and uh, it requires a lot of work and a lot of manpower and time and effort and support from families and friends and physicians, and it's definitely a, an issue for, for some women athletes. So prevention's great. We do pre-participation screening at universities and high schools now um, in the U.S., and if it's a properly done questionnaire, there should be some questions on there that screen for eating disorders 
questions we put in like, are you happy with your current weight? Are you trying to lose or gain weight? Um, how much would you like to be? You know, things like that. Do you, do you have uh, things that you don't eat and why? So just kind of little testing questions that if they say yes on certain things, then we'll ship them off to a nutritionist or do further sort of questioning and intervention. Um, and then education is important. This is just a picture of some, some awareness programs that have been out there for athletes. And uh, the multidisciplinary approach, the treatment is very multidisciplinary, often sports nutritionist, sports psychologist, um, low threshold for intervention. When I was at Stanford with a lot of the runners, we used to have them sign a contract um, and they would have to you know, maintain certain things, blood tests for this and wait for this before they were allowed to train or do certain things. Um, I have a few patients now that you know, they can be hospitalized pretty easily if they're young and they're having trouble. So it's really important to intervene and try to change the practices. Um, restoring the energy deficit, we've traditionally always said, you know, 20% of training a day a week or increase your caloric intake, but again, it's not always that easy. Some, in some girls, it's very difficult for them to do. Even doing that doesn't often um, help turn things around for a while. Um, and, the, you know, this isn't super common in cyclists. It's certainly more common in runners, triathletes, um, because cycling is not as much a weight-bearing sport, um, so you don't typically see stress fractures in cyclists. You see more high-impact fractures, but you can see some disordered eating for sure and the amenorrhea. Uh, so in conclusion, female athletes have different needs and unique medical concern, um, and we need to screen them more, a little differently from males and uh, address those concerns. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Take questions. <laughs> it's a good question. Yes. So. So she asked about cycling being not a weight-bearing sport and you're not building bone density. And so that's a, a kind of another topic, but I have, you know, now we're getting, we're seeing more women in cycling. We're seeing a lot of high school kids doing a lot of cycling. And whenever I see them, I'm on them about milk, calcium, and cross-training. So they have to do some weight-bearing activity. It's very important. I, you know, just specializing too early is not great. Um, adolescent years are a very important time to do different sports, impact sports. We know that ballistic sports like basketball and gymnastics help build better bone architecture. And so that's a, an issue with cycling that I think I would love to study, you know, long-term going forward, looking at these girls' bone densities. Um, we know that just a little bit of jump roping, um, hiking, running, especially in their off seasons, I try to get them to run or hike, um, is important and that can help maintain it. So even, you know, in the middle of the season, they're not gonna do as much cross training. They could do a little jump roping. Um, and then at the lower level, certainly they should be doing other things. And in the off season, do some trail running, do some hiking. It's a good point. Thank you. Yeah. Efficacy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So she's asking about calcium supplements and what you should do. And um, you know, I, so I always say for an athlete, I like around 1,200 to 1,500 milligrams a day for a female athlete. Um, so you get about 300 milligrams per serving of dairy in dairy. So if, it, adult women don't tend to drink milk anymore you know maybe we'll drink a latte but the caffeine takes away from the calcium absorption so we talk about supplementing there are different kinds and they're absorbed differently calcium citrates the best kind um, but calcium gluconates not too bad you know soy and almond milk advertise oh there's twice the calcium of regular milk yeah but it's not the same quality so you have to take twice the amount to get the same calcium as you would from just a little bit of milk um, so calcium citrate's the best. The, the Viactive chocolate chews are pretty good too. I think they're calcium gluconate. Um, but just, you know, eyeball your intake, 300 milligrams per serving in yogurt or cheese, and you want three or four or maybe even five of those per day if you have low bone density. So it's better to get it from your diet. If not, you can supplement what you're missing if you kind of calculate the deficit. Yeah, so it doesn't go down in the same way for men, so it, typically. Um, there's definitely the question of a, a male cyclist, what's their bone density like, or a male swimmer. Um, so because men don't have estrogen regulating their bone density, they have more um, testosterone and other, they do have some estrogen, but they don't go through menopause and they don't lose the estrogen. So it doesn't actually have that decline the way it does in women. Um, and men tend to have more muscle mass and maintain that a little better, which helps with the bone density. So there's, there's different factors and risk factors, but the good question being is, do male cyclists have low bone density? Um, I've certainly seen a few patients, older men, doing nothing but cycling, not eating maybe as much as they should, that ha their bone density is not great and they get fractures pretty easily. So, so that's a whole other topic, but 
that could be an issue. Cycling's non-weight bearing. Again, the importance of weight bearing sports and not just doing one thing, even though if that's what you're doing, you know, cycling, but adding a little bit more of that in. And certainly in men, we do check in, in we don't, there's, it's not standardized testing like it is in women where you'll do a bone density after menopause, but it, we'll do it in older men if we're worried or if we see an x-ray where their bones look, look thin. Uh, the question was, do we, do male um, cyclists lose more bone density through sweating if they're on the bike for long periods of time because some studies have shown that they have lower bone density than couch potatoes? I, I don't know. I, I don't know those studies. I think I would argue that the couch potatoes probably have higher body weight, so when they're walking around, there's more impact on their bones than the cyclists. <laughs> this, well, it's true, because, because body weight has a big impact on it. That's why, you know, higher risk factors for osteoporosis are thin, um, Caucasian, low body weight. And so I think being on the bike and not doing the impact exercise, but then the lower body weight, and, you know, I, I think that's probably a bigger role. I, I don't know the answer to that, but... We could look at it in the, in the studies for sure. Yes? It's a good question too. Is there more weight bearing in downhill BMX than road cycling? A little maybe, but it's still, you're still off weighted. So you get a little more upper body, <laughs> you get a little on your lower body, but it's still not equivalent to hiking or running or anything like that because you're unweighted by the bike. You know, the bike's taking the impact. You're using your muscles to do some shock absorption, but you're not getting much of that with gravity. It's, I think that was more, there's hormonal, it was the amenorrhea and the lack of estrogen and the hormone changes that relate to the cholesterol abnormalities, not, not the bone loss. I don't think there's a correlation between bone loss and cholesterol. Sorry, a mountain frequency. Well, I think definitely in the off season. Um, we've talked about this at our Medicine of Cycling conference. There was another uh, physician that spoke about that. He did a whole talk on it. He thought that some jump roping through the season, like you could do 30 seconds five, five or 10 times a day or three or four days a week. I mean, anything is good. Uh, jump roping has a fair amount of impact. Um, walking up the stairs instead of the elevator, which you don't do when you're a cyclist because you're saving your legs for the ride. So, you know, <laughs> it's hard. But, you know, on your day off, do a little bit of cycling or jump roping. You know, weights is good. It's not as much impact, but doing some weights, leg weights. So you got to do it mainly in the off season if you're racing a lot. But if you can do a little bit, a little bit a day is great. You know, jump rope for two minutes. It's helpful. People are looking at the ballerina for beauty as well as for music. And often thinness is part of the cultural beauty thing. How do you deal with the psychology of thinness um, for anybody, but yeah, it's, particularly for ballet. It's tough, and in sports we focus a lot on performance. Um, in ballet you can't do that as much, but in sports you can really do it. You know, performance is based on how much you eat and your muscle strength and all of that. In ballet, because it's such a culture of the long lines and the leanness, and it's tricky in ballet. Um, again, you, you have to, it's, it's based on health and performance, and you can, with the, the kids that age, ballerinas don't want to get injured because if you're injured, you're out, you get lost, and you, you're out of the flow. Um, so you can promote that a little bit, um, the risk of stress fractures, you know, that with the menorrhea, things like that. But it's, it's tricky to try to just keep them rounded and educated and promote the health. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Thank you.